you actually need to have aversive experiences. You need pain. You need failure. You need loss. You need fear. If you're actually going to figure out your resiliency and what you're made of and find, you know, the why of your life. So if you work too hard to avoid unhappiness, paradoxically, you're going to avoid happiness. Hello, and welcome to the Psychology Podcast. Today, we welcome back Arthur Brooks to the show. Arthur is the Parker Gilbert Montgomery and Professor of Management Practice at the Harvard Business School. He's also a columnist at The Atlantic, where he writes the popular weekly How to Build a Life column. A world-renowned speaker, he talks about human happiness and works to raise well-being within private companies, universities, public agencies, and community organizations. His latest book, which he co-authored with Oprah Winfrey, is called Build the Life You Want, The Art and Science of Getting Happier. In this episode, I talked to Arthur Brooks about building the life you want. People often think that happiness is a static end goal. But in reality, life will always have its ups and downs. According to Arthur, we can make choices that can improve our well-being despite the presence of challenges. He talks about how to find satisfaction through family, friends, meaningful work, and faith. Arthur also shares actionable steps around managing emotions and habits that can help us create a better life. We also touch on the topics of neuroscience, transcendence, evolutionary psychology, and Arthur's favorite topic, love. It's always great chatting with Arthur. He's a good friend, and I really respect his work a lot. His new book with Oprah really dives deep into the science of happiness and offers everyone a way to find happiness in their own way. I think you'll really enjoy this episode as much as I did. So without further ado, I bring you Arthur Brooks. Hey, Arthur. Welcome again to the Psychology Podcast. Hi, Scott. It's good to be on the podcast. It's been a long time. You know, I always listen, so I feel like I'm with you every week, but I only get to be on the podcast once every couple of years or so. So what a delight. That's really kind of you to say that. Well, you're uh, you might get the record for the most times ever appearing on this podcast. You're a real friend of the show. Uh, I love it. It's it's official. (laughs) Well, it's you know, it's it's amazing what you've been able to do, which you have this role in public education. I mean, you're Mm. you and I are trained social scientists, but, and you're, and you continue to be a major force publishing as an academic, but at the same time, bringing these big ideas to a, a, you know, this is the most popular psychology podcast out there. And so you're bridging the gap. You're running the seam between the practical and the academic. You're the old, you're the ultimate pracademic, Scott. What? We, oh, I like that. Oh, no one's ever called me that before. You're pracademic. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Arthur. Um, but obviously, uh, we're going we're gonna to shine the spotlight on you today. So let me uh, let me return that volley. Congratulations on this new book, Thanks. Build the Life You Want. I'm kind of glad, in all transparency, I'm kind of glad you didn't title it uh, with the word happiness in the title. There's you know? too many books with the word happiness, although the subtitle is The Art and Science of Getting Happier. But that's actually one of the big points that's good. of the book. Right. I mean, the point is that that happiness is not a destination. It's a direction. It comes and, from building a life. Yeah. 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 And not to mention the fact that you don't want unmitigated happiness. You don't mm-hmm. want, uh, you know, happiness that has no intrusion from negative emotion or you'd be dead within about a week. Plus, you wouldn't be able to find more happiness because you need challenge and opportunity and you need growth mm-hmm. that comes from suffering. And so the whole point, actually, Oprah my co-author, Oprah Winfrey, she was the one who, who coined the right noun. She created a new word. She said, the goal is not happiness. The goal is happierness. Yes. Well, that seems in line with the Dan Harris, 10% happier yeah. sort of idea. Yeah. 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 So now how did you, how did you become friends with Oprah? Oh. <laughs> no, where did you two, did you two meet at a bar? <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Um, it's, it's, it's sort of interesting. So you and I talked um, after my last book came out yeah. um, from strength to strength, which was about yeah. finding purpose and significance in the second half of life. And Oprah read that book too. Turns out that she, all the way through the coronavirus epidemic, had been reading my column in the Atlantic on Thursdays. Um, she, she's a super, super heavy reader. I mean, she reads everything all the time. She's a fast reader. Um, she loves to read. And so she reads a lot of stuff, but she was, she became kind of a, kind of a fan of the column. And I didn't know that. I mean, it has 500,000 readers a week. So who, who knows, you know, when, when, <laughs> who's reading your stuff. And so when the book came out, she read that and then she called. And she's like, this is Oprah Winfrey. And I'm like, yeah. And this is Batman. Really? Who is this? <laughs> right. And uh, because I've known, of, I've known of her, she's an iconic yeah. figure my whole life, but I'd never met her before. And she asked me to be on her podcast about the 
you know, she has a book podcast called Super Soul, which is a phenomenal podcast. And she's an incredible interviewer. I mean, she's the best in the business. Mm. And she was interviewing me about my book and she was quoting me by memory while she was wow. interviewing me. Wow. And, and afterward, I said, that was, that was amazing. I mean, it's like we were separated at birth. She said, yeah, I know. I know. And so we just started talking, you know, offline and, you know, cooking up things we might be able to do. And I went out there. I, you know, we had dinner a couple of times and, and then, and then she said, you know what we ought to do? She said, we should write a book together that takes this class that you write, that you teach at Harvard University. I teach at the Harvard Business School, this class called Leadership and Happiness and turn it into something that's that, like academics, academically significant. But it's accessible to millions of people. Why can't millions of people get a version of your class, which is a class on how to get happier and help other people become happier? And I said, yeah, right on. So we actually started on that. I went you know, to her place in California. And uh, over a, about a three or four day period, we sat out in her tea house and cooked up this book and the whole structure of the book. And then we went back to our corners and started writing chapters and passing them back and forth. And the, the rest, as they say, is history. It's fantastic. That's fantastic. It's a fantastic book. So I assume you two see eye to eye then on a lot of things. Was there anything you two didn't see eye to eye on where she's like, I don't think happiness is that you know, or whatever it was? It's, uh, you know, not really. When she challenged things, she was almost always right. Um, mm -hmm. And I realized that uh, and part of the reason is because she's not a she's not a happiness scientist like you and me. Mm. I mean, she doesn't have this academic background, but she has yeah. incredible common sense and she's extremely well read mm -hmm. and highly intelligent. So. So the questions that she would ask would be these clarifying questions that would help me remember exactly what we were talking about, like the happiness versus happierness idea that we talked about. The the, the, it's not a destination. It's a, it's a direction. You know, that mm. kind of stuff really came from Oprah on this, and it put a much finer point on, on what I'm trying to do and say in, in a lot of the science part. And then, you know, I was cooking through a ton of references. I mean, you're, you're in the book course, because your work is so uh, significant in our field, there's a thousand academic references in the book, but they won't trip anybody up because the book is written in prose for normal people that are not trying to read academic journal articles. Yeah. Well, th that's what's, that's, what's needed. Get the stuff, you know, you, you can't, the, every, the, every person in the street, you know, you, it's all these things are hidden behind paywalls. Yeah. You know, you can't read these. And, and even if you did read them, <laughs> most people wouldn't understand them. Academics don't even understand them. You have to read so carefully. And, you know, these days, 30% of what I do is neuroscience. And really? you know, my, yeah, for sure. And 30% of my class is neuroscience at this point, because, you know, those social scientists, we have to know how the brain works more and more. Mm. I finished my PhD in 1998. There was no neuroscience in my field in 1998. Mm. And today it's every place. And so, you know, the way that I introduce happiness ideas is all the questions, they come from the philosophers and the theologians and the, th and the you know, the, the, the big thinkers. Then the mechanism of causation is the neuroscience. And then all of the testing and evidence comes from social, social psychology and behavioral economics. And then you apply it to your life. But the point is you need that step. And so 30% of my class at Harvard is actually neuroscience. So, you know, I'm, I'm studying neuroscience on my own literally every day. And I have been for about five years now. Right on. Um, you know, I have my own concerns about the reductionism of neuroscience. Sure. I know you happiness. do. Yeah. There's a famous philosophical um, thought experiment that I start off my class uh, on happiness with, with my students. And I asked them, would you raise your hand if you would rather hooked up to an IV drip that gives you um, feeds happiness 24 seven into your veins and you don't have to work for it, or you have to intentionally work hard for the happiness. Right. Most people end up choosing the working hard part. Right. So I guess I get concerned about using too much of neuroscience for like supplements, you know, like, oh, yeah. we change your brain with this supplement and then it'll make you happy. I don't think most people want the easy route to happiness. Is that fair to say? It, well, it is because people, they intuitively know they want to be fully alive. Mm -hmm. They want to be less uncomfortable and actually have less suffering, but they don't want to completely numb themselves. They want to have this fully alive experience and people understand intuitively that that all of the components of happiness, the enjoyment that you get in life, the satisfaction with the things that you're achieving, the meaning that you're trying to derive from your life, all of those parts, the macronutrients of the of happiness, they all require unhappiness. And so if you could, you know, if you could get the blue pill of perfect happiness, it would mean that you're sitting on a chair someplace, you'd be someplace in the matrix. That's the truth of the matter. And 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 nobody, wa I mean, the point of that movie, The Matrix, was that the red pill is it hurts, man, but it's totally worth taking. And everybody who watched that movie would be like, yeah, I'd take the red pill. 
I'd take the red pill. And that's what they're telling you, Scott, in, on the first day of class, that they'd take the red pill. So would I. I thought the blue pill was Viagra. <laughs> <laughs> What's the new that? blue pill? Oh, okay, <laughs> gotcha. Let's not get that confused. <laughs> yeah, no, that's not that one. Yeah, although yeah, that yeah. can increase happiness. You know, I just I just posted on my Instagram yesterday an evolutionary psychology study about well being that found that in the well being positive psychology researcher they research they tend to leave out some really evolutionarily important things like sexual satisfaction and status and and even physical attractiveness. Like we poo poo those things in positive psychology, not poo poo, and no, it's not. Like we say, oh, sex is bad, but things like, you know, even like status and attractiveness, we're like, oh, those aren't the things that bring you happiness. But it turns out in this research that that if you're really low in those things, it, it really can be a source of, of right. unhappiness. Would you agree with that? Oh, yeah, for sure. And the point and the really interesting thing about that is if you look, um, if you get the data on and anything from, you know, the amount of sex that you have to how, how beautiful you are to how much status that you have. You find that from a very low level, happiness or well-being, day-to-day life satisfaction and contentment rise, and then they hit a high point, and then they start to fall again, which is really interesting. So you'd think, you know, people are listening, they're like, what? Too much sex? It's impossible. It is possible. So you find that beyond, you know, for most people, um, beyond about 120 times a year, satisfaction in life starts to fall and relationship satisfaction starts to fall, believe it or not. Holy cow, wait, 120 120- times having sex in a year is that what you're saying yeah yeah beyond that and most people they start to have lower levels of of relationship satisfaction and some and there's actually been some experiments that have shown this where you have treatment and control and you know control is whatever you want and treatment is you have to do it every day Hmm. and you find that that couples start to get along less when they they feel like they have to do it every day and and there's lots of reasons for that right i mean there's there's a there's not a it's not always a good time Mm. Um, in, in the happiest of marriages, it's not always a good time is the whole yeah. point. But the same thing is true with beauty, for example, physical beauty. Mm. That you find that people, they get more attention. The world is made for beautiful people. I, I mean, beautiful people um, can be incompetent, still get jobs, can, can say stupid things, and people will laugh at their jokes for sure. But beyond a certain level of beauty and people start to objectify you, I wouldn't mm. know, by the way. People start to objectify you in such a, you know, a strong way that is dehumanizing and, and then your life satisfaction starts to fall. So a little is good. Too much is bad. This is one of the reasons that once you get past a certain level of money, more money raises your anxiety. I mean, you can actually have, there's a curvilinear relationship and that, that does not go up and up and up and up forever. Good things, too much. We need, I mean, this is Aristotelian, right, Scott? This is yeah, golden need. I'm really glad, um, you know, we're talking about this. I am so excited to announce that registrations are now open for our self-actualization coaching intensive. While the coaching industry has taken great strides over the years toward integrating more evidence-based coaching approaches, there is still a lot of work to be done. Many coach training programs still lack strong foundations in science and do little to incorporate research-informed tools, methodologies, or approaches for helping clients thrive. For 20 years, I've dedicated my career to rigorously testing ways to unlock creativity, intelligence, and our potential as human beings. Now for the first time ever, I have compiled some of my greatest insights to bring the new science of self-actualization to the field of professional coaching. This immersive three-day learning experience will introduce you to self-actualization coaching, an approach intended to enhance your coaching practice by offering you evidence-based tools and insights from my research that will equip you to more effectively help your clients unlock their unique potential. Self-actualization coaching is a whole person approach to coaching that aims to help the client find their most alive and creative center of being, connect deeply with themselves, and become who they truly want to become. Grounded in the foundational principles of humanistic psychology, self-actualization coaching also draws from the latest psychological science, including the fields of positive psychology, coaching psychology, developmental psychology, personality psychology, neuroscience, and the science of creativity. Don't miss out on this unique opportunity. Join us and take your coaching practice to the next level. Register today and get 20% off. Don't miss out on this very special event. Go to sacoaching.org. That's sacoaching.org and get 20% off today. I look forward to welcoming you in December. So Barry Schwartz and Adam Grant, I believe they both wrote an article showing that almost every psychological trait in psychology goes with that kind of inverted u-shaped curve <laughs> sort of thing you know too little is not mm-hmm. good but too much is not good either i think they went right. like they wrote this this seminal paper where they went down the line 
showing that sure. applies to everything. Yeah, um, you can actually be way too fit, for example. You know, you find that, you know, body fat percentages before they get to the point that they're damaging for your health, you'll start mm -hmm. to become unhappier. And, and there's a reason for that. There's a balance that we're trying to get between, you know, body fat and eating what we want and all these kinds of things. The truth is that life requires that we be fully alive and that we be balancing different things. There's no, there's no benefit without cost, mm. you know, and there may be some cost without benefits, but the whole point is you have to live like a normal person. And this kind of extreme version of everything that we're pushed into in our internet culture is really deleterious. It's really unhealthy. I agree. Um, you also, let's add even more nuance to this because you argue in this book that unhappiness is not your enemy. And I right. think that's, that's important because some people might infer from when you talk about the benefits of happiness, infer the inverse, you know, is yeah. that it's, it's always necessarily bad, but that's not the case, right? It isn't. And, you know, it's, it's funny because our society tends to oscillate back and forth between unmitigated positive emotion and trying to eradicate negative emotion. And you and I both know being, you know, trained academically that, that, that happiness and unhappiness are actually not opposites. Unhappiness is not a lack of happiness. On the contrary, that the emotions on the negative and positive sides of the ledger are produced sometimes in physically different parts of the brain. And we need them both because they're simply signals. The problem is that when we, we become sort of extremists, like in, you know, Woodstock, um, if it feels good, do it. That's life ruining advice. But so is, <laughs> if it feels bad, treat it and make it stop. That's life ruining advice oh, too, because what you're doing then is that you, 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 you stay in the mode of, of searching for pleasure, for example, and never get to never add the, the, the grit into the pleasure seeking parts of life that can make it into enjoyment, which is part of happiness. You never, you get, you can get stuck on the hedonic treadmill trying to feel good, feel good, feel good, feel good, which as we both know, and anybody who listens to the psychology podcast knows what the hedonic treadmill is. It's I can't keep no satisfaction, basically. Mm. So you try and try and try. Or or even worse, they can't get a sense of meaning in their lives. Meaning is so critically important. And you actually need to have aversive experiences. You need pain. You need failure. You need loss. You need fear. If you're actually going to figure out your resiliency and what you're made of and find, you know, the why of your life. So if you work too hard to avoid unhappiness, paradoxically, you're going to avoid happiness. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a really deep truth that I think it's hard to maintain that in your in your working memory on a day to day, you know, minute by minute basis. Right. But it's a really deep truth. You talk about the four pillars of happiness. And I, I just wanted to mention them real quick. Family, friends, meaningful work and faith. I feel like you've called the faith thing something else in the past. You've called it right. like the divine or or transcendence. Transcendence. Sometimes. Yeah. And, you know, that's that's more along the lines of how you talk about it when you're mm -hmm. when you're looking at sort of late Maslow. I mean, you're, you know, you're a hero. Yeah. You got a poster up in your bedroom next to your bed of Abraham mm -hmm. Maslow, I know, in a cape. And uh, next but, to and my Britney Spears poster. <laughs> <laughs> so the whole idea of, you know, early on, of course, he thought, you know, the pinnacle of human life is self-realization. But later, of course, he talked about transcendence yeah. and self-transcendence as something that was actually bigger than that. And and so when I say faith, it's a placeholder for transcendent experiences, things that actually put us into perspective to, to as they used to say in the old days, to get small. And part of the reason for that is that if you're stuck, uh, me, 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 my lunch, my commute, my job, my podcast, my it's just, man, it's just super boring mm -hmm. and unbelievably tedious. And if you can zoom out on the majesty of life and put things into perspective and you do it regularly through, you know, the wisdom of the ages, I don't care if you're studying the Stoics like our buddy Ryan Holiday, mm. or if you are um, you have a meditation practice or you're walking in nature without devices, or you're studying the works of Johann Sebastian Bach, or you're practicing, you know, a traditional faith like I do. I'm a, I'm a serious practicing Catholic. All like I, I won't tell you which one is cosmically or metaphysically right, but I will tell you that they all have the same transcendent benefit and give you access to experiences, literally, that we simply don't know how to to achieve any other way. I mean, you've seen this new literature, Scott, haven't you, about the, that that religious experiences or transcendent experiences are the only way that we've been able to stimulate the, the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system simultaneously mm. to give you alert calm. This, it's just this crazy stuff that we're actually starting to see in the literature right now that, that, you know, there's no substitute for these experiences. It's so true. And I just feel like that is so tied with the ego transcendence. Right. I think, I feel like these things are so tied to each other. Yeah, um, for yeah, sure. We, the, our own ego is such a source of our own stress that we don't <laughs> even realize. 
right? Okay. Like our parasympathetic <laughs> sympathetic nervous system it is a lot of it internally generated. You know, it's like, oh, this person's doing so much better than me. I've got to right. dominate them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or something bad is about to happen to me. Something bad is about to happen to me. And part yeah. of that is that, you know, you've written about this and, and talked about this so much is the maladapted stress responses that come from modern life where we're in on it. We, we treat, you know, a bad tweet the same way that we would, you know, treat an, an animal stalking us on the savannah, hmm. um, you know, which, you know, extreme spikes in epinephrine, norepinephrine and cortisol. Yeah. It's complete craziness. And the result of that is in the modern life, we can go through with these chronically elevated levels of, of, of stress hormones, which is incredibly deleterious to, to both health and happiness. And so we need relief is the bottom line. And part of that comes from knowledge. Part of that comes from changing habits. But a lot of that is just this this four pillar life that's based on different kinds of love, which is the ultimate balm is the balm of Gilead. I mean, it's like this, uh, you know, love of the divine, love of your ha your family, love of your friends and love expressed to the whole world through the way that you earn your daily bread. I mean, not everybody can do the psychology podcast, which is your act of love for the universe. But but if you do anything in love, there's nothing small and nothing insignificant. Yeah, I know that you uh you're a big fan of love. <laughs> I, know, yeah. I know you talk a lot about love. What you know, sometimes there's like fake love. You know, sometimes there's people who uh you know, you know you cuz you've said look for real friends not deal friends. Right. Can there be deal friends in the guise of love? Is that is that does that exist? I know this sounds cynical, but yeah. does that exist? Yeah. So, so, you, so what you're referring to is this one of these one of the other pillars. So we started with the faith pillar, another pillar of happiness. That's really indispensable is friendship. And, and there's a friendship crisis all around the world, but especially in the United States. I, I don't know if it's especially so, but it's certainly the case. You know, our, our wonderful uh, Surgeon General Vivek Murthy has written a book on loneliness. Mm -hmm. And it shows chapter and verse how people have fewer and fewer and fewer people who are close to them and know them well, even though they're more and more surrounded by people. Of course, all of this has been exacerbated by the catastrophe of COVID-19, which is like, you know, the, the Loneliness Full Employment Act is the worst. but but what we find is that we've we've lost our friendship chops insofar as that we've become so unbelievably practical. You know, we have a lot of deal friends, but not so many real friends. And the difference mm -hmm. between the two um, is that the deal friends, the people with whom you do you know, work, for example, you see every day, they're useful. And that's great. But your real friends that you need to be happy are useless. You need useless people, not worthless. I have those people in my life, too. Useless friends. We need more of that. And that just takes work because, you know, mm -hmm. like keeping up with the guys you went to college with and, you know, the people that, that can't do anything for you when you're working 12 or 16 hours a day, like so many people do, is a really, really hard thing to do. So the question is, does that mean the deal friends are bad or, 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 or not helpful? And the truth is, no, you, th that's okay too. Those are good things too. They're just not enough. It's just not an, it's a, it's a, it's a diet that's just not nutritious enough. For your friendship, you need both, and you can't do without the real friends. So you need Kantian friends. <laughs> yeah, Those good who, point. Uh, categorical yeah, sure. imperative. Uh, you don't need anything from. Well, you, don't you don't need anything from. And by the way, Kantian in the sense that they tell you the truth. <laughs> yes, I love. Yes, I love that. I love those kinds of friends. Yeah, um, not I like too, them sometimes. Too, yeah, I was going to say not too much <laughs> of the truth. Not too much of the truth. It just seems paradoxical to say you need friends that you don't need. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> yeah, you need friends that that are not useful. Yeah, you know, you need useless things in your life. There's all kinds of cosmic uselessness that we need. And that's a deeply Aristotelian point. So Aristotle talked about the telic versus the atelic. And the, mm. that, that based on the Greek telos, which is the purpose of something. Mm. And he said, there's special joy that comes from atelic love. Mm. You know, there's, that's what, you know, the perfect friendship is based on. You have this, this ladder of friendship where at the bottom are the transactional friends that we have to be the deal friends. And then above that, there are friendships based on beauty where you admire something about somebody. But at the highest level, the the friendship of virtue, the perfect friendship is atelic in this way. And usually the way that you know it, you can recognize it is because you have a shared love often for a third thing. And that's all there is. It's not useful in any, any you know, economic sense, but maybe it's you love to build birdhouses or you love baseball or, you know, or, you know sometimes it can be deeply, deeply meaningful and even useful. My, my wife and I were best friends. We have this shared love for our children and grandchildren. And, you know, that's a really special thing, yeah. you know, but, and so, but it doesn't have to be that cosmic. It can be something that's, 
as silly as a hobby, whatever it happens to be. But that's that thing that, and, and Aristotle talks about walking together side by side, looking outward at the thing that you both love. And that's, that, that's, that has a special kind of metaphysics to it. Well, that's beautiful. Yeah. Not just metaphysics, but poetry. Yeah. <laughs> a certain poetry to it. Well, okay. Let's talk about the work pillar for a second. Cause you say your work can be love made visible. Yeah. What does that mean? Well, that actually, that phrase comes from the, the Lebanese, the early 20th century Lebanese poet Khalil Gibran, um, who talked about make your, make your work love made visible. And if you can't do your work with love, it would be better to you to sit by the gate and beg alms from those who do their work with love. So it's funny, isn't it? You know, as an old yeah. fundraiser, that has special, <laughs> special meaning for me. I spent a lot of time at the village gate begging for alms, let me tell you. <laughs> uh, it's raising money for my nonprofit organization. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the, the whole idea is that, that your work can be love made visible. That's a central idea in many religious movements. And so that's not just a, something that you and I as social scientists would want to latch on to. You know, on the contrary, you know, there's a, there's a movement in Catholicism called Opus Dei that many people have heard of. And that means work of God in Latin. But really, the whole idea is that work is prayer, that you should make your work a form of sanctification by using it to love others and to show your love for God by the excellence with which you do your work, which will then be understood by others will be magnetic. It will bring joy all around you. And I know that's hard to do sometimes. I mean, that's unrealistic sometimes. Let's not kid ourselves. You know, I have the probably literally the best job in the world. And I teach at Harvard and, and I have a column in the Atlantic and I write books. I mean, it's like, what's not to like? But there are days when I'm sitting at the airport for a three hour delayed flight, you know, cursing my fate. And then I have to remember, am I making my work love made visible? You know, if somebody says off chance, I think I, I think that guy is that guy who writes about happiness for the Atlantic and I'm sitting there, you know, cursing or, or, or you know, that's not right. And so it holds you to a higher standard such that your love really can lighten the burden of somebody else, lift other people up. And, and then when you do that, here's the I mean, the, 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 the really interesting thing that you and I have both noticed in our work is that if you really want something in your life, give it away. If you want more love, don't go around asking for love. Love more people. That's what you do. If you want more happiness in the world, display more happiness. Figure out ways to actually get that done in your own life and give it to other people. And then, then boom, the world starts to open up. God, love is such a big theme in all your work. Um, you wrote this book, Love Your Enemies, which we yeah. had a whole other podcast chat about. Yeah. And, yeah, um, yeah. In what, to what extent can learning to love your enemies increase your happiness uh, versus being the kind of person, and we all know these kind of people who hold resentments for every small slight, you know, those yeah. people like every, you know, the kind of the victim hood mm-hmm. mentality, you run amok on steroids. Yeah. yeah. yeah well, hatred, um, the Buddhists always say that hatred is like uh, holding a hot coal in your hand because you want to throw it at your enemy. The first one who gets burned and the, the person who is burned the worst of course, is you. Hatred is incredibly self-defeating and deleterious. And so it's it's just, it's actually dangerous. Hatred is really dangerous. And and I, I get why evolution has given us hatred. You know, I, I, it's unambiguous why we would actually have this, this response to fear and anger is that we would have hatred toward another because we, we need to defend ourselves, but it's so maladapted in so many social situations today. And it's so, uh, greatly accelerated by the technological means at our disposal. I'm talking about Twitter or X or whatever we call it these days, that it's just a, you know, it's something that's a hate machine, man. And then people will start to adapt their brain chemistry to little hits of hate. I mean, we, you you and I do so much stuff on dopamine, which is the neurotransmitter of the anticipation of reward. And, and then you can, you, you can get hits of dopamine around almost anything if you continuously hit the lever again and again and again. So people go to Twitter looking for the almost outrageous, hateful content uh, content because that gives them that little neurophysiological reward and, and on and on and on. Wait, wait, why is hate rewarding? Hate is rewarding because it's a, it, it gives you this little sense of your rightness. Oh, it's neat. It gives you this little sense. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 It's like, I hate that guy. And, and the reason I hate that guy is because I'm good and he's bad. This is what, um, Ad, uh, uh, who is it? It's Adam Waits at Northwestern calls oh, motive yeah. attribution asymmetry, mm. right? Who has that really beautiful research that shows that almost every implacable hostility is based on the error where both sides believe that they love, but the other side hates. 
right? And, and, and what actually happens in that is that both sides hate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if you're going to think that way. <laughs> yeah. You're setting and, yourself up. But it's up. also usually, it's often based on the error that, that the other person hates you, which is not mm. the case. So most, um, most mm. marriages can be saved if there's actual honesty, which says that I'm acting like I hate you because I feel like you hate me, but I actually love you. So let's just make a deal and love each other. What do you say? That's how John Gottman actually brings couples back together again is by, is by resolving this mode of attribution asymmetry in, in a very practical way. And that's love your enemies, man. I mean, that was the most transgressive teaching in human history comes from, you know, the fifth chapter of Matthew, the 44th verse, where Jesus tells his disciples, you have heard that you should love your friends and hate your enemies, but I give you a new teaching. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Mm. unbelievably transgressive. I mean, it's like if you do something that transgressive to your biology mm. and your tendencies, if you stand up to your, the animal self, you will be on the divine path. Mm. And, and it's just, it, it's completely life-changing is the whole bottom line. I asked the Dalai Lama about that one time, because as you know, he and I've been working together for like 11 years on this. And, and I heard him say one time, I destroy my enemies when I make them my friends. And I said, your holiness, I thought you were a pacifist. Why do you want to destroy anybody? He says, no, 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 no. What I mean, he destroys the illusion that the person was his enemy. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. what we're trying to do is destroy illusions along the way. Look, not everybody bears us goodwill. I get it. But you're never, never going to be, you know, sorry that you were not a jerk. <laughs> I love that. Uh, yeah, but there's a big um, continue. There's a big uh, wide space big gulf between hate and love. Those are two extremes. Um, the research shows <laughs> that people with low self-esteem view ambiguity as hate. So yeah. most people, they just don't care about you. It's not that yeah. they love or hate right. you, but for some people who demand respect all the time, you know, like people, a lot of people with low self-esteem tend to actually start to demand that they are respected everywhere they go because they don't right. have that internal sense. Right. They tend to view just ambiguous um, facial expressions as right. hate, you know? Right. I don't know what exactly to make of that, but it seems like, it just seems like, you know, love and hate aren't the only two options. We also can kind of just be neutral to each other, like, and, and just tolerant, sometimes sure. just tolerant. Like there, there's um, certain faiths that are not for some things, right? And it doesn't mean you need to hate the things that you're, not for right. you can still be tolerant of them but does, does it mean you have to love them that's right. an interesting i know that's a little controversial of a question but right. it's nuanced right well it is except that it's also worth pointing out that love doesn't have to be a feeling as a matter of fact it's best when it isn't a feeling and now attitude, love is best when it, when it's an act of will when it's a commitment mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. saint thomas aquinas based on aristotle aquinas said in 1265 to love is to will the good of the other as other that's, That's the wonderful. definition of love. And Martin Luther King, he preached about that when he was preaching about, you know, love your enemies. There's a very famous sermon. It's on the internet. People can listen to it if they want. It's so beautiful. You got to go listen to it. He actually had the flu when he was giving it too, and he was still, you know, the best. It was in 1957 and in Montgomery, Alabama, November 17th at the Dexter Street Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama. And he said, Jesus didn't say that we have to like our enemies <laughs> because liking is a sentimental something. But to love our enemies, we have the opportunity to redeem our enemies if we decide to love our enemies. And this is the key point. So, yeah, for sure. You know, the idea that love and hate are these feelings and how am I going to go negotiate these feelings? And, you know, I write all the time about the science of emotion. I can, you know, I can go on and on about that. But when it comes to love, the biggest problem like happiness is assuming that these things are feelings. They're not. They're actually not. They, they transcend feelings. Thank God they transcend feelings because, you know, I've been married for 32 years. I would have been married for 32 minutes if love were a feeling. Oh, damn. <laughs> oh, damn. <laughs> well, you know, I'm really glad you made the point. Uh, they made the point about kind of these things are more of attitudes or ways of being, as I would put it, ways of being in the world. Eric Fromm just wrote about that so wonderfully in The Art of Loving. I don't know. Oh, yeah. you, I'm sure you've read that book. Of course. And, you know, love is an attitude, but also hate. Hate is an attitude. He said people have a readiness to hate. And I see, I feel like I'm seeing that all around in this society. People are ready to hate people who they perceive in their out group. And it's a readiness. It's an attitude. It's, not, you know, it's like they even meet the person <laughs> and already they're hating the person. Yeah, no, that's true. And, and part of the reason for that is just because we have such an identity culture, an identitarian culture. And identitarian cultures, they tend to be very uh, primitive. They tend to be sort of tribal. Mm. 
And the first thing that our evolution tells us is that anybody who's outside your tribe should be should be uh, seen with suspicion. And you should start with the baseline of hate before love, because otherwise you're going to trust the wrong person. And the cost of that, if you get it right, that's nice. If you get it wrong, you're dead. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, evolution does not favor love your enemies indiscriminately. That's why you have to fight evolution if you want to transgress these these sets of ideas. And what we what we have right now is a a period in which we've become primitive, quite frankly. You know, you and I hang around on college campuses a lot, and it's extremely tribal. It's extremely identitarian. And 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 furthermore, it's rewarding certain personality types that feed off of hatred. I mean, you're you're sort of the granddaddy of the dark triad personality. You've written as much about that as any academic, I think, in the world, at least I'm in the, the granddaddy of the dark triad. Wait a minute, can I can I just like put that on my website? <laughs> <laughs> by can which I'm not saying that you're a dark triad personality. Can I be the granddaddy of the light triad? Can yeah, I yeah. be that instead? Well, you, you literally invented the light triad. I mean, yes, you, I, yes, the you, light you triad. Literally not the dark that. triad, but the light triad. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the dark triad comes from 2002 when people yeah. recognize that narcissism, Machiavellianism, and psychopathy, trait psychopathy, they tend to go together. You've estimated it's about 7% of the population. And then you've identified its kind of opposite, its personality opposite, which is the light triad of virtuous personality characteristics, which is so incredibly important. The problem is that when you're in a sort of a primitive tribal moment societally with a lot of polarization and being fired up by media that profits off this sort of out outrage industrial complex and politicians that we have who are incredibly populist, which, you know, they're not leading this, they're just following the general trend, that you're going to have all, all kinds of energy that feeds on hate. Hurricanes feed on warm, warm water. And, and, you know, dark triad polarizing populism feeds on hate. And so the result of it is that you have narcissists that are saying they're victims, you know, yeah. virtuous victims. Yeah. You have Machiavellian people who say that these enemies, you, of course, you lie and you cheat, of course, because, you know, they're going to cheat on elections. I'm going to cheat on elections or whatever your thing happens to be that you're talking about. And you have people with trait psychopathy, which means that they're willing to basically break any rule. Because might makes right or, you know, justice at any cost as we define justice. And that's that's the kind of moment that we're in politically. It's the kind of moment that we're in socially as well. And that's, you know, hatred is the fuel of all that. It really is. And and you made a really good you made you know, a lot of good points in your book. But one other good point in your you made one good point in your book. No, but you're uh, the granddaddy. That was my good point. <laughs> I love by the way, I love that. I'm the granddaddy of that. But I, I think yeah, you made a really good point in your book about the fact that conflict is not necessarily a bad thing and it doesn't mean you're showing hate to someone if you have a conflict with someone you can show love and have conflict this is such an important point let's double triple quadruple click on this yeah because we're not seeing that in our society today we're seeing uh, yeah. conflict and hate kind of being the same thing yeah i know people are super worried about conflict and the worst part is that when you're really conflict diverse you're going to sacrifice relationships you can paradoxically become more hateful towards somebody because you're because you're avoiding conflict. This is one of the biggest problems that couples have. I, I worked with a guy for a long time and, and, and he told me about his first marriage. Mm -hmm. And he said, yeah, you know, we never had one single fight until one day we just sat down and talked about it and realized we'd never been in love. Mm -hmm. and, and it's funny because, you know, I'm married to a Spaniard, as you know. You know my wife's from Barcelona. We got married in Barcelona. And, and there's not been one day without a fight. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like for, for Spaniards, fighting is just another form of communication, basically. And, you know, for the first five years or so, I'm an American. I was kind of aggrieved and sort of injured until I realized this is how we roll, man. And we're not going to we, we we never lie. We never lie. And if you never lie, you're going to have disagreements. and You're going to have to work them out is the bottom line. The, the thing is not to disagree less. It's to disagree better inside relationships. That's that's really what it comes down to. And there's a funny thing, Scott, that, that you notice. I, you know, I work a lot with young couples. Um, my wife and I, we, we counsel young couples that are engaged, actually, um, as part of our, you know, we're Catholics. And that's a common thing for older couples to do. And one of the things that you, we tell our young couples is that, that, you know, people will say there's sort of a cliche that after you have a huge fight, sometimes a couple will make love. That's makeup sex or something. It's not actually what's going on. When you have a fight that's constructive, where you use we words as opposed to I and you, it's not accusatory. It's kind of a project. We need to work something out. Even if it's quite bitter, those sometimes are the most intimate moments in a relationship. 
in a romantic relationship because you're saying things that are really on your heart that you might not have said for a long time. And you're hearing things that are deep truths, even if they hurt you. And sometimes after a fight, you've never felt closer to that person, even though you're angry and sad and she's crying and, but you haven't felt that close in a super long, don't waste it. Don't waste it. That's when you're close. That's, that's generative. Yeah, no, it's a really good point. Um, a lot of this is very, um, kind of monogam monogamous uh you know sort of focused can you live a can you build a good life being polyamorous which is very popular these days i mean the whole the the, the younger generation they're obsessed with you know sex positive things now which is anything but monogamy right now have you looked into that into that well-being mm. research because I, I bet there's large swaths of our audience that are that are not into monogamy yeah. So the, the interesting thing is when you look at the data that there's a lot of sympathy toward non-monogamy among a lot of people that aren't having any sex. Hmm. So, which is a really interesting phenomenon because you, paper. yeah, That's because you find that, that sexual activity is actually much lower than it has been in a long time. Hmm. They find that more people, uh, more young people, people in their twenties, for example, are having no sexual activity. And very frequently they tend to display attitudes that are quite progressive or liberal. When it comes to monogamy so that's an interesting thing so i one of the things that i think is possible is that that non-monogamy is more theoretical than practical in a lot of people's lives and that's worth looking into i don't I haven't seen anybody do that that you know the, the the granddaddy of this research of course is eli finkel uh, uh, yeah. he the, was on this uh, podcast right? yeah. yeah he's fantastic yeah. he's fantastic he's taught, thought a lot about you know how marriages work etc one piece of research that actually uses a, a data source that you and I have used in our research as well, the General Social Survey at the University of Chicago, has looked at, you know, across the population, what's the ideal number of sexual partners in a year for uh, self-reported life satisfaction? So you don't say... With, with the same partner? Or this is a number of... Well, different how many sessions? partners in a year? Oh, okay, gotcha, gotcha. So it has to be the same partner if it's one, obviously, Yeah, right? yeah, no, gotcha, yeah. No, gotcha. yeah, just... yeah and, uh, and it turns out that happiness peaks at one. It turns out that less than one is lower happiness than one and more than one is lower happiness than one. So that's what you find is that one person in a committed relationship, according to those data for most people. Now, what we don't know uh, empirically, and you can, you know, we can differ morally on this. We can, this, we're not having a conversation about what's morally. Or, no, no, science. We're talking about happiness and et cetera. And what we don't know is if there's substantial variation across the population, you know, different strokes kind of thing. But for most people, According to that that research, one is the right number. Yeah, I guess the there's a there's a contradiction between um, research looking at most people and the whole notion of building the life that you want. Right. You know, because I associate building the life with you want with my project as well, which is self actualization. And, right. You know, each every person's on their own unique self actualization journey. Right. I mean, I know I have friends who are polyamorous who are so happy. Um, they they couldn't stand the idea of being monogamous. <laughs> they, they would break out in hives. <laughs> they had to be monogamous. But um, and they're having a lot of sex, you know. But I don't know. So I guess like I just think that's there's an I don't know what to do with that. But let's put a pin in in that duality between the project, the dual projects we both have. One on the one hand, wanting to look at the science of averages, and then also helping each individual build the life they want. They don't. Those two things don't always go together. No. And, you know, that's actually the case when almost everything in the social sciences where you want to get big patterns mm -hmm. across major ideas, mm -hmm. but then you want to look at the variegation across individuals as well. So, for example, I talk in the in, in How to Build a Life about the four pillars of the happiest life, which I believe for pretty much everybody works. But what they mean inside each pillar, what, you know, when I talk about faith, as we mentioned before, my Catholic way isn't necessarily the way for somebody else. That's good. But the faith pillar is the real deal. It's the transcendental pillar. So you try to you try to zoom out as much as you have to to get general patterns, and then zoom much zoom in as much as you need to to give individual recommendations to people so that they can figure out what their version of that happens to be. This is really good. So within when you talk, when we talk about family, you know there can be kind of a loose definition of family. Family is a political uh, arrangement, but it's a personal arrangement as well. And it really depends. I mean, like everything else, you know, how are you defining it? Are you defining it like the government defines it? Or are you defining it like you define it is what it comes down to. Yeah. But the truth is, however, when I'm talking about families in this research, mostly what I'm talking about people who are biologically related to each other. Mm. And oh, you know, so that, 
Yeah. Okay. And that's really the most mystical kind of love because yeah. you didn't choose it, but it's super intense, right? It's crazy. Okay. It's crazy. You know, it's like, these are people who can absolutely push your buttons and, and, and you really care what they think. It's funny. I mean, how, how unbelievably heavy it is. You know, my dad has been dead since 2002 and every day I still think, I wonder if he'd be proud of me. I mean, it's, and I'm not, I'm not, in, it's not a problem. You know, I'm not suffering from this, but I think about my dad a lot. And the reason is because he's imprinted on, he was an academic like me, you know, and it's the family. So was my grandfather. It's the family business. And, but I wonder, you know, I wonder if my dad would be bragging to his friends about this new book that just came out. They you know that kind of thing. And that's because these mystical bonds are so, are so uh, unindelible. Uh, kind of on our souls. And, you know, that's mostly what I'm talking about, that we we have to turn that into something good as opposed to you know, a, a source of ongoing pain mm-hmm. by letting schisms happen in our family life, which so many people do for stupid things like politics. Oh, man, that's such a good point. And you talk about honesty and forgiveness is absolutely key to cultivating a healthy family, right? Right. But that's, yeah, but that's easier said than done with, with blood relatives. Oh, uh, it's hard. It's hard. And that's part of the point. Because when you have that ongoing challenge, there is so much growth. You know, when you're working on these family relationships and you're turning them into a project as opposed to just, you know, a source of annoyance, it's really, it's a, it's very generative and you learn about yourself an awful lot. It's one of the things that Oprah and I write about is how to turn these conflicts, these inevitable conflicts into a source of growth as opposed to a source of pain, ongoing pain. Mm. And, 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 you know, we all experience these things. You know, I have three, I have three grown kids. Um, you know, my my 25 year old and 23 year old sons are both married. Um, my 25 year old's a father, and and so you know, it's like we're proliferating, and so there's lots of opportunities to learn these new things in the, <laughs> in yeah. the framework of the family relationships. And the fact that it isn't easy is actually a good thing. Yeah, it is a good thing. I mean that that idea of suffering leading to ultimately greater levels of happiness. I mean, having children is can be suffering at times, but it right. leads to... Oh, man, there's a lot of suffering with kids, trust me. Yeah, it leads yeah. to some of the most meaningful things. No doubt that a text has come into my, my phone <laughs> since we've been talking, that if I looked at it, I would be alarmed right now. <laughs> you keep it real, my man. You keep it real. You're, I'm still I'm still actually chuckling at your earlier comment about your wife saying, <laughs> I'd be married for three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, it's, you keep it real. You keep it. No, yeah, I love yeah. it. No, people actually think, you know, it's the funniest thing. You know, people, you know, I, I, I study happiness for a living. I teach and write and speak about happiness for a living. And people yeah. are like, man, you must be so happy. It's like, dude, that's why I write about happiness. Yeah. It's me search, you know, and, you know, you and I both, we know almost everybody in the happiness field. They're, they're in search of happiness. That's the reason that we deploy our toolkit to this is because it's a challenge for us. You know, I, one of the things I write about in this book, for example, is there's this very, very, very good self test on, on that separates your positive and negative emotion levels, intensity. It's called the PANIS test, the positive affect, negative affect series. You've seen it a million times. It's psychometrically really valid. It's a good construct. And, you know, one of the reasons that my general well being levels tends to be lower than a lot of my students despite the fact that I do all this work is not because my happiness is too low. It's because my unhappiness is too high. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't know that if it weren't for this test, which everybody should take by the way, because we, we classify people into different quadrants of their personality profile or their emotional profiles. They can understand themselves better, but you know, that's, that's how this, this work actually gives you knowledge. And then once you have knowledge, you can, you can do work on yourself, which is a huge adventure and super fun. And you can make a lot of progress. God knows I have in the past five years, I've gotten 60% happier. I can tell. So I yeah, just want to say, I just want to say, first of all, your energy today is incredible. Thank like you. I'm so happy for you. Like I can tell that you're like, there's, there, well, you have a happy halo around you right now. Yeah. <laughs> There are days, you know, it's, you know, I'm we in all have our my, days. Yeah, for sure. You know, I'm, I'm, I just, my, my semester started yesterday and I have a book that's a brand new book and all that. And so there are going to be days when I sleep three hours, et cetera, and I'm not going to be my perfect self. But the truth is that one of the things that we wrote about in this book, partly because I've been trying to practice this so much is a topic that you and I have discussed before called metacognition, which is thinking about thinking. And in so doing, moving the experience of your emotions from the limbic system of your brain into the prefrontal cortex, where you can actually manage your emotions. And one of the techniques for doing that is called emotional substitution. 
where I recognize an emotion that I'm having, which is a reaction to phenomena and might be quite logical, but it's not the only emotion that I could have under the circumstances. And when I analyze myself appropriately, I can take the one that I have and I can take the one that I want and I can choose the one that I want. Mm-hmm. I give examples of this in this book. You know, a guy that I pal around with is a guy named Rain Wilson, who's a, who is a, an actor. Uh, he was, he played Dwight in the office for those, you know, who don't I know, know Rain actors. Wilson. Wow. Yeah, Rain Wilson. He's fantastic. And he, you know, he grew up five miles away from me in Seattle and we're the same age. I played the French horn and he played the bassoon. We're not childhood friends, but we bonded over those similarities. Anyway, and Rain says that one, I asked him one time, I said, why, why is it that so many professional comedians, um, they're, they suffer from depression? And he said, it's not because comedy makes you depressed. It's because depression makes you into a comedian. And I said, well, Tell me what you mean. He said, because in the terms, because he knows my research, he says, in the terms that you talk about, your limbic system gives you sadness and you switch it for jokes because that's also an appropriate response to the things that you're feeling. But you can only do that if you're metacognitive. You can only do that if you're self-managing your emotions and you recognize you can do that. So for me, you know, a lot of days when I feel resentful, I choose gratitude. When I feel uh, pessimistic, I choose hope. Because I can, and and I, and I've I've learned how to do that through my research. It didn't just come to me, you know, immaculately conceived. It came to me because um, uh, I believe I have this gift that was given to me of this education that made it possible for me to improve my happiness and try to spread it to other people. Yeah, so many really deep truths there. You know, the uh, as I teach my students with the the panas that you just mentioned, the positive emotions, the negative emotions, they're not opposites of each other. They're actually not as strongly negatively correlated with each other as people might think. It's only like the point three, you yeah. know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and also with earlier, you said the light triad was the opposite of the dark triad, but we found that's not true either. That's true. You, They're you not can opposites. A lot of both. I know. Yeah, a lot of both. Yeah. So that's why in that analysis, I sent you a, a paper today. We looked within person yeah. and saw at um, profiles of within people. We found most people are a mixture of light and dark. It's very hard to find a pure darkness individual, know. you know, but it's also kind of, it's actually, it is easier though to find a pure light individual. So that's, there's some optimism, optimism there for humanity. Like we yeah. got like 40 something percent are pure light, which is cool, but, but yeah, but, um, uh, and they lie. Of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Those, those, those are really problem, the dark tribes. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, we'll be corrected for that. We corrected for that bias. I know you do. You're <laughs> yeah, a good we, researcher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're a super good researcher, but it's Thank interesting you. that, that um, I think it was a one to five scale of dark triad, which is narcissism, Machiavellianism, trait psychopathy and light triad, which is the sort of the opposite sounding sounding, version. but yeah. it's just, it's just a, an antagonistic orientation towards others versus a, a, a positive, uh, loving orientation towards a others. loving, a beneficial. Yeah. We call it a beneficent yeah. orientation. Towards and the them. average person on a one to five scale is two point five dark and about three light, according yeah. to your estimates. Amazing, amazing. Yeah, yeah. But more people really are, you know, uh, light traits than dark traits, and uh, maybe we don't really acknowledge that as much. It's all. It's same with progress. A lot of people don't want to acknowledge that. We've made progress in 500 years of of humans. You know, we've also, you know, not most people really are at least a little bit above uh, the light. You know, the average mark. Uh, most people are yeah. not walking around. Well, there's a down. reason for that, though. I mean, there's a, there's a reason that we have a hard time acknowledging that. And it's not because we want to think that humanity is doomed. Mm-hmm. Although some people do want that. I mean, you're mm-hmm. you're going to get clicks and followers if you say humanity is doomed for sure. Mm-hmm. But there's a there's a negativity bias that's programmed mm. into us by evolution. You know, if somebody's smiling sweetly across you, uh, across the room from you, that's nice. But if somebody's frowning at you in an angry way, that gets your attention in a big way because that can actually be dangerous if you don't notice it. You know, you miss a nice thing, too bad. You miss a bad thing, woe be unto you and to your family. You don't know. And so the result is that that evolution has made us a lot more acutely aware of the negative. So even if the negative is a small percentage of the positive, it's going to get our attention. That's why those studies, those really interesting studies ask for you to remain in a neutral mood. How many good things have to happen to you versus how many bad things at, in a day? And for Americans, it's about three to one. You need three good things per one bad thing for you to go to bed and say it was an okay day. <laughs> It's different in Asia, interestingly. So if you look in the studies that look at Japan and Korea, for example, it's two to one because mm. these are c- 
culturally different places for sure. But the negativity bias is a real deal that we have. Now, mm-hmm. how can we, how can we understand ourselves and self emotionally self manage by recognizing that? And to say, I'm not going to maladapt that tendency into thinking that I'm having a crummy day because I'm paying attention to crummy things. Mm. I'm paying attention to crummy things because my inner troglodyte leads me to do so. Mm. But if I choose gratitude when I feel resentment, then I can recalibrate intellectually toward greater reality. And for all of us and for Scott and Arthur and everybody watching us, I mean, we have a lot to be grateful for, but we don't recognize it because that's not evolved to keep us alive and passing on our genes. If we want to be happy, we have to recognize that mother nature doesn't care. Mother nature does not care if you're happy. And so you have to make a lot of adjustments and with the knowledge and practice, you can do that. Love that. I would refer for more. I'd refer people to my uh, course. I taught with Oprah on gratefulness. Uh, <laughs> thanks to, thanks to the recommendation of, yeah, that's Oprah a nice works. video. It's called yeah. build the life you want, which is Oprah's, um, um, that's her video, her YouTube show. Mm, that was really that nice. That was, a, that, was a, that was a nice thing you did. I liked it. Mm, thank you. Thank you for <laughs> recommending me. Um, you know, uh, let's just leave with, uh, with what I think is one of the most profound points of them all, and that's that to build the life you want to have happiness is actually a lot simpler than you think. You know, you say keep it simple. Maybe it's just commit a period of time each day to your spiritual or philosophical life. Maybe it's going out connecting with nature or spending time with loved ones. It's all a lot more simple than we we tend to think. Is that right? Yeah. And and a lot of it has to do with discipline and routines. It really does. And, you know, learning all of this has very much changed my life. Mm-hmm. You know, and so, you know, I was always kind of a spontaneous guy. I mean, as you know, I started my life as a musician. I spent... Yeah. From when I was 19 till I was 31, I was a full-time professional performing musician, mm. classical musician. So there's a lot of discipline in that. It was in the Barcelona Symphony, a lot of it. But, you know, I had this kind of smoking and drinking and and I realized that- And what that, else? And what else, Arthur? You almost said something else. <laughs> well, you know, 20-something. I was a 20-something, yeah, yeah, you know? Yeah. But, you know, the, the good thing is when I was 24, I fell in love and, you know, that was the last and, and only. So um, mm. that was my, my- It took me, by the way, it took me two years- to convince my Spanish wife that marriage was good, that marriage, she, I don't believe in marriage. She said, I was like, I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see about that. And so it took me two years of, I literally moved to a country where I didn't speak the language and knew no one hmm. to try to convince a girl who didn't speak a word of English that she could marry me. It was the, it was ridiculous anyway, but you know, all's well, it ends well, three adult kids, one grandchild, 32 years later and still going strong. But the whole point is that during those years, I was a kind of an undisciplined character. But today, I mean, it's like it, it's like anything else. You know, I was also not that healthy. I used to get a lot of colds and, you know, I didn't feel good. And and now I feel at 59, my health is way better than it was when wow, I was. Wow, you're 59? Yeah, oh. I'm 59. And, you know, my, you know, I, 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 just, I start the, the day the same. I get up at 445 in the morning. I work out for an hour. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then I go to the gym. I mean, I, at the gym. And then after that, I go to mass. I go to mass every morning. Wow. And, and then I come back and I tank up on coffee at least 90 to 120 minutes after I wake up. So the adenosine clears in my brain. All of this stuff is based on the social science and the neuroscience because I got to optimize my pattern so I can be creative. So I'm, you know, as good as I can be under the circumstances with the people that I love. And it really comes down to these particular routines. Mm-hmm. At night before I go to bed, I pray my rosary, which is an ancient Catholic meditative prayer. Um, I make sure that I read scripture every day. I make Mm -hmm. sure that I call people in my family, that my real friends, I spend at least an hour uh, a week on the phone with each of my real friends, the people I've designated as such in my heart and my mind. And all these come from my, it's like, I have a life built on research, Scott. (laughs) I know, I know. It sounds like you're putting Andrew Huberman to shame here. (laughs) Nobody puts Andrew Huberman to shame. I mean, Andrew Huberman's got, I mean, he he probably has 200 pounds on my bench press. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I know. But I hate, but he, I know, I'm joking. I mean, he's a friend of mine. It's, but, I don't know he, him. I hear he's fantastic. Oh, I love his stuff. Oh, he's, a, he's another person I listen to every week besides you. There's only like two of you. I should make an intro between you guys, actually. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen you on Instagram with those tight shirts. <laughs> you, you don't do that. You don't put them on by accident. <laughs> and you look great. You look good. No, you look really great. Um, hey, man, when you're bald, you yeah. got to get whatever you can. Well, it's just, but bald signals high testosterone too. So, or something. This is a, this is a once great civilization. <laughs> Suffice it to say that I would gladly give up muscle mass for your hair. Really? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I've got a lot of hair. It's true. You look, you look great. I would oh, love that. Yeah. Go on. Your stop is stop going. You know, my friend has the stop <laughs> hand with the go on hand at the same time. Uh, Hey, I really want to just thank you again for being such a return customer of this re- re- repeat. Um, and uh, congratulations on the book. I wish you and Oprah well. Please tell Oprah Dr. Scott says hi. I will <laughs> absolutely tell her that Dr. Scott, my friend Dr. Yeah, Scott, is yeah, uh, yeah. you know, and I, and I thanks for thanks for reading the book and yeah. and and helping to spread the message that all of us can know more about happiness, practice more happiness achieve more of it in our lives in this ongoing journey and just as much as anything else lift other people up in bonds of happiness and love using science and ideas it's the best news of my life that we can do this let's let that sit there for everyone thanks again arthur thank you scott Thanks for listening to this episode of the Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com or on our YouTube page, The Psychology Podcast. We also put up some videos of some episodes on our YouTube page as well, so you'll want to check that out. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the show, and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.